Welcome to the Remarkable Dentist Podcast with me, Fred Joyle, where I interview amazing dental practice owners digging into their successes and failures, their insights and hindsights, getting their views on where dentistry is going, and discovering what it took for them to become remarkable. Welcome to the Remarkable Dentist Podcast. This is episode number one, and I'm very excited to have as my first guest, Steve Bilt, who is the CEO of Smile Brands. Now, if you don't know what Smile Brands is, it is one of the largest dental support organizations in the country. It has 650 practices as of this moment. Uh, but more importantly, Steve has created a phenomenal business culture. He and I have been friends for a really long time, and he's somebody I, I really admire because of this dedication to culture, not just to success in and of itself. In fact, he's been ranked uh, as the number one CEO uh, in, in uh, the top 25 uh, practices in health, businesses in healthcare, uh, best CEO for women in 2020 by the organization comparably. Um, and in terms of 2021, Pepperdine's Business School ranked Smile Brands number eight out of 150 impact companies. I mean, this is a, a phenomenal achievement. Uh, and so, Steve, welcome to the Remarkable Podcast. Thank you very much, Fred. I'm honored to be here. And so I, I, the first question that comes to mind, most of, of what I'm going to be doing on the Remarkable Dentist Podcast is talking to practice owners who are dentists. You are obviously uh, involved in, in the ownership of many, many practices, but also the, the, the management of a business uh, that goes way beyond that, that is, that is the next evolution of, of the dental industry in many ways. Um, let's go all the way back. Uh, what got you started in dent? What made dentistry the choice? Well, I had been in healthcare service my whole career, so I've been in a variety of healthcare specialties, all healthcare service related, generally more uh, traditional healthcare, dialysis, asthma allergy, cardiology, orthopedics, things like that, um, the rehab business, the speech occupational and physical therapy business. And, you know, one of the challenges there, having grown up in a household that was a more traditional, business household. My dad was in the manufacturing business and I had the newspaper routes and you know the various shoveling of the sidewalk businesses. And there was always an element of business that appealed to me, which was if you could deliver a better service or product at a better price that, the, that your customer perceived to be higher quality, then you would win in business. And if the opposite was true, you would lose in business. And those of us who come from more traditional healthcare, if we had a business mind, that would be the frustration point in it, that the healthcare system really didn't adjudicate winners and losers based on things like quality, value, consumer perception. It was on other things like networks and payer sentiment and, you know, in, in the rehab business, we used to call it fruit basket marketing. You'd show up to the discharge planner with a fruit basket, and if they liked the fruit basket, they'd send patients your way. And if they liked someone else's fruit basket better, they'd send them their way. And that really offended some business sensibilities of mine, not, not from a capitalistic money-making standpoint, just from a how do you create a better experience for a consumer standpoint. And so dentistry, as I started to research it, we had sold the large dialysis business that I was a senior finance exec in and it's kind of what's next and came across dentistry. And at the time, as you well know, this is, this is 1997 when the research was going on 98, when we started the business, about 50% of the country wasn't in regular dental care. And if you would have asked me before that, I would have said, I don't know, everyone I know goes to the dentist. It's probably 90% of people go. 20 years later, 23 years later, now last year, 39% of the country went to the dentist. And so something's just wrong in our delivery system, in the way we reach out to the consumers, in the way we message consumers. I'm sure we'll talk about that given your uh, yeah. 
affinity for marketing, but some something wrong with the messaging. And so it really appealed from a from a business standpoint that if we could find a way to make it more user friendly, an easier category to access, that we could could actually create a business. And as I've been in it all these years, I see the complexity and the things that take dentists away from doing dentistry. Uh, it, it's a longer list than I would have ever dreamed and, and gives us an ability to do what we do well and give dentists a chance to really excel at what they do. well. Yeah, you basically come in on the, on the business side of it so that it, it can be more effectively delivering dentistry. And it's been a challenge. And uh, But I want to zero in on your, um, I'm going to call it an obsession with culture. Yes. Um, <laughs> because uh, I'm a big believer in it. You know, both my books, I talk about the, the absolute importance of creating a patient experience through culture. But you drive your whole business by a very simple mantra. Yeah. Uh, and so elucidate us on that. Sure. So I, it goes back to the original explanation I just gave you on, on why get into the business. I felt like there was enough complexity around this business and enough points of differentiation in terms of value add that you could legitimately eyes up all data revealed, all data revealed, create a business model where each of your constituents could win, have the experience they wanted. And you, as the business, could also win, meaning have a successful business. And so we've said, you know, our books are open. We'll talk to them. We'll share them. We show them to our docs. We tell our docs, we expect you to take our P&L as seriously as you take your paycheck. But the good news is, you know, the quid pro quo is we take your paycheck as seriously as we take our P&L. So we really wanted to create a world where we'd advocate for each other. And if we were successful, we'd be successful together. And that's the way you can create a long-term success, right? If you have a practice where you're making a fortune as a DSO and the doctor's not thriving, that's a temporary success. But if you're a doctor being supported by a DSO and you're making a bunch of money and the DSO isn't, that's a temporary success also. And the same is true with suppliers. If you're getting an incredible deal and they're losing money on you, that's a temporary win. That's not going to last. Right. So all these things, when there's a win lose relationship, are temporary. Now, if there has to be a win lose for your business to work, you're not in a good business. Sell it. Right. right. But if you're in a business where you can achieve a win win with your counterparty, then you have a successful business if you guys are aligned. And so culture is about alignment. So we talk about our employees. We talk about patients. We talk about providers, talk about suppliers, our investors in our broader community and say, we want a win-win relationship with each of those. We used to call that the virtuous circle. That was the business model. Can we, in this virtuous circle, ask our counterparty what would make them feel successful? And then can we achieve it while in balance with our success criteria? That evolved into, and I became kind of obsessed with this whole three-word concept and you know, trying to get a three-word mission. And that came from coming from businesses where we sat down for days and days or weeks with third-party consultants, wrote grand mission statements that included everything under the sun, and then came out with something that, A, could have been any company almost in the world, and then, B, no one could possibly remember because it was too long. It had three sentences and six semicolons, and it just went on and on. And so I said, let's do this in three words. Went back to our virtuous circle and said, who are we trying to create this win-win relationship with? And the answer was everyone we do business with. And if you're like me, when you win, you do what? You smile. And if you're in dental, smile works. So we created the three-word mission statement, smiles for everyone. And we said, look, this is what we're about. Circular was important. So we, we put it on wristbands. We weren't ahead of Lance in his crew when we put them on, but we were right behind him. Put them on wristbands that the whole team wears. It becomes a three-word statement you see all over our business. And we start all of our meetings and talk about obsession. It is kind of that way. We start all our meetings saying, you know, our purpose is to move closer to our mission of delivering smiles for everyone. How does this meeting tie to that vision? And we'll literally talk about that. And it just became an incredibly important part of our culture. It became this touchstone. And it's the filter that we run everything we try to do through. And when you do that, if you stay with it and you're relentless, it works. But the thing I'll add for people, 
is the reason it's so important to be three words and the reason it's so important to repeat it is you're trying to program your organization, yourself first and your organization to think that way. And I use the example of an exercise book, right? We all think we can go to a seminar and learn something. We all think we can learn about changing our thinking and have it changed. But we don't feel that way about exercise. Like we understand most of the muscles in our body. There's only one muscle we don't really understand very well. It's up here in our heads, right? The rest of them, we get it like, oh, I read an exercise book. I'm in better shape now. No. I exercised last month. Therefore, I'm still getting the benefits of it. No, but I remember the exercise. Aren't I getting the benefits? No, of course not. But we don't do that with our behaviors. We don't exercise the chains. So that's where this obsession term comes in. It's like you got to exercise it. So we've created these rituals to force us to constantly exercise around it. I think that's the difference. It's not that anyone's values are better or worse. It's just how much you exercise and connect to those. Well, but simplicity, as you said, made it so easy yeah. And it's also it's it's zeroed in on on a universal filter yes. that you could say, well, what's this meeting about? Is it going to be smiles for everyone? What is this vendor relationship? What is what is this patient communication? What it, it when everything can run through it, and if the answer is no, you get to say, then why are we doing it? And it's incredibly powerful. As you say, that I've, I've read more mission statements and working in advertising yes. where it's, it, as you say, it could be anybody and make sure it has the word innovation in it for sure, <laughs> you know, no matter what, as if that's not, you know, of course you're innovating. What, what are you about? Um, yeah. And, it, you know, Nike did, did such a good job with their three words of just do it because it suddenly said, we're making exercise about everybody acting. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is your, the other word that you use is relentless is that you're, you're in it to make this the behavior for everyone and you're vigilant about it. Um, a lot of people have their core values and they're, they're up on the wall or they're in the employee manual and, and that's where they go to die basically. Um, yeah. And it is really about those, you know, there's espoused values, which is, you know, no one espouses like we're in it to rip people off. We're in it to make a crappy product. I mean, everybody's going to have positive values by definition and they mean to, I believe that. But then what are your values in action? And, and your values in action are only as good as that exercise element of it. It just has to be constant. And that's, I think, the struggle is, well, we talk about that. Everyone knows that's our values. Like, you know, that's just not reality, right? You're constantly having to exercise to achieve it. You're constantly having to challenge those things. And, and I think that's the most important part is how often are you taking it out? How often are you talking about it? How often are you acting into it? And, and it takes a lot of intentionality. And that's difficult because you kind of, every time you start to go do it, you go, well, everybody already knows this. But it's not that everybody already knows this. It's, it's that you're, you're getting stronger every time. You're teaching new people. You're pushing the behavior. When you make a hard decision, you say, well, it doesn't tie to our values, right? Here's how it doesn't tie to our values. That's why we're doing this. And it's pretty remarkable because as a leader of an organization, it's much more what people see you doing, right? The action they see you taking than it is about what you're saying. And so you can talk about your values, put them on the wall. But then when you go to make a decision, if it doesn't have your values in the heart of it, your, your mission, your vision in the heart of it, they know that's just for show. Right. And so that, right. that's yeah. what becomes, it becomes really it's all talk. Right. Because we, we see, you know, if you say integrity trumps profits, but you're making a whole bunch of decisions that, well, if we can make enough money, then we can dial the integrity yeah, down we'll do it. Yeah, accordingly. We'll do it. Yeah. You know, then they go, oh, so, so it's a, it's a situational integrity thing. Yeah. You know, um, I want to, you know, part of what I want to do on this show is really talk about the, the hindsight insights and the and the successes and failures and uh and, and one of the things i want to ask you is what surprised you about dentistry or has surprised you as you you've been involved in it for for all these years you know i i will tell you i'm never cease to be amazed at, at, at 
fundamentally just how hard people in the profession have to work at their craft. I mean, you think about you know an operating environment the size of a baseball and all these complex procedures that need to be done and a pretty extraordinary patient expectation, right? So any other medical profession, it's kind of like, hey, doc, can you just get me functioning again? Can you just get me back to close, right? In dentistry, they're like, yeah, I know God made me like that, but I want to be up here. <laughs> Make me better. It's like, wow, that's a big ask. Right? So there's an expectation that that's very high on the dentist. There's an incredibly broad array of procedures that the dentist can do. There's a consumer component, meaning they have to pay for part of it. So now you're mixing healthcare and fashion to some degree, right? So you've got this element of like, this is restorative. It's going to make you better. This is going to make you look better. It happens to be part of the same procedure. So now I have to talk about that, talk about the consumer having to pay for a significant portion out of their pocket. And so there's more business complexity and more medical and artistic complexity in that this profession than any other medical field I've been in. And then you combine that with the convergence now into healthcare, oral healthcare being the gateway to systemic healthcare. And that's a lot of burden on yeah. a system, if you will, and a lot of things to reconcile. And, you know, that, that takes hopefully all of us, right, a village, as they say, right, to, to come together to really help a consumer understand, yes, this has cosmetic elements. Yes, this has preventative elements. Yes, this has uh, restorative elements. Yes, this has, you know, significant preventative elements to your overall health, maybe even predictive elements. And by the way, our country is not participating at nearly a high enough level with all those things being true. And it's not if they're true, all those things are true. So it's a huge opportunity for those of us in the profession to say, wow, we can really help a lot of people if we can increase participation in this sector and make it more accessible from a financial standpoint for people. And we can do that, that win-win element. We can do that by lowering the overall costs of providing the care without, without sacrificing the ability to have a good business or a dentist to make or for any provider to make a good living as well. Yeah, and a lot of that is just business efficiency. Oh, yeah. So that so that the you can run at optimum so you can be profitable, have a good successful business while being affordable. It's it's a big challenge, but you've proven it over and over again with your practice models that it it can be done and and everybody wins, which I, which is uh admirable because I, I think and I'm I'm curious about this if you've seen it, but I'm starting to see that uh, th that this pandemic has created a, a quantum leap forward in an appreciation of the connection between their mouth and their immune system and their oral health and their immune system. Because we've been inching along on this awareness. And have you seen that? Yeah, you know, Fred, one of the things I used to lament is I think it was 25 years ago, the cover of Time magazine, you know, mentioned the linkage between perio and cardio. And it kind of just sat there for the last two decades without really any significant rise in awareness. And it feels like during the pandemic, the acceleration in that conversation was extraordinary. And I think two things happened in my mind. One was we in the dental profession, as the pandemic hit and everyone got sent to the sidelines, were saying, well, wait a minute here. What are we doing? Like there's a huge prevalence of emergency room visits from dental pain. Anyone who's ever had significant dental pain, like needs a root canal or break cracks a tooth, you know, in the nerves, I suppose, they know you'll do anything to get care, including going to the ER in the middle of a pandemic. Worst possible outcome. So it doesn't make sense to shut dentists down. Dennis also had incredible protocols going into the pandemic with regard to, to um, overall safety, right? And that goes all the way back to the 80s, right? So incredible protocols. So dentistry was pretty well prepared 
in every way except for the public knowing it was well prepared. So suddenly we all had to get a much louder voice during the pandemic to say, hold on a second here. This is an essential service. And it seemed like right as we were really screaming from the rooftops, this is an essential service. We need to be open. Look at all these people that are staying out of the ER. Look at all these people who are staying out of pain. And oh, by the way, this isn't a two week or a three week or a two month crisis. This is a longer term crisis. You can't just kick dentistry down the road without having significant problems start to emerge. And so fighting to stay open and really pounding the table saying we need to be open, a bunch of research seemed to roll off the line at the same time relative to Alzheimer's and cardio and a bunch of other conditions, which was powerful. And the pandemic continued and you saw the problems build up, right? More tooth fractures, more periodontal problems. As the research was saying, those are really those aren't just bad things; those are really bad things. So I think it was a little bit of a perfect convergence. I don't want to call it a perfect storm, but a perfect convergence. Which there's a huge burden on us, kind of the old guard of dentistry that's still involved in it, to make sure we don't drop this ball. Like yeah. this is powerful. We need to understand this message and amplify it. So dentistry flies forward. I mean, you think about it. Hundred years ago. It was the barber chair, right? Now we're in this place where suddenly we're right at the convergence of all these healthcare issues. And as you know, in business, and this is business or public policy, you when that opportunity emerges, you either seize it or you get pushed back. And if you get pushed back, it could be, who knows, another 100 years, right? But there's an opportunity to, to drive it forward. And that's where dentistry needs to come together and amplify that voice. And I think dentistry's come further in the last 12 months than it had come in the 20 years that I was in it before that. And it's really exciting. And so can we get the public more aware? Maybe, you know, but I think there's another aspect to this, which I know you'll appreciate, which is it's about business efficiency and it's about sector participation. And I think we need to define what sector participation is in a way that works for the next generation, not the one that works for you and I who grew up with the ADA ad saying, go twice a year and you're compliant, right? I mean, there's there's a whole consumer out there that's saying, wait a second here. I used to have to go twice a year before you had fluoridated water, fluoridated toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, uh, electronic like toothbrushes. All these things have changed. So do I need to go twice a year or do you need to go twice a year or do we all... Or do I just need to make sure I have a dentist and can I get this tooth straightened or this one cleaned up? Or get So I think we have to meet consumers like every other space, meet the consumer where they are, get them involved in our sector, but don't tell them or shame them if they're not there on some schedule that we've predefined for them. So I think there's a huge opportunity and, and that's probably the third, of, the third or fourth river converging that we can yeah. really use to accelerate this profession. Yeah, and it, it is ours to seize, uh, as, as you say, because it will recede. There, there's plenty of other things going on, you know, but there, yeah. you know, as, as the administration changes, the focus will change again. Uh, and, and so, uh, and this, this pandemic is, has shown a resistance to disappearing. Yes. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I, I think more and more people who have put off their dentistry for a year or more are saying, yeah, this is too long. But but there, you know, we have to make sure we get out the message that it's it's one of the safest places you can go is the dentist because we've been infection control conscious for way longer than than most of than certainly your supermarket um, and where you're going every other day. Uh, but uh, but to add to that, Fred, as we go, as, as they come back, as patients come back, we have to listen first as to why they came back. Oh, yeah. And they didn't necessarily come back saying, oh, I'm so upset I didn't get my x-rays. Or I'm so upset I didn't get that profi. They might be saying, I'm so upset because my teeth aren't straight. Or I'm so upset because this there's an element of pain. Or I'm so upset because I never took care of this problem. We make sure we hear them first and address why they came back. I'm not saying you don't do a full mouth set. I'm not saying you don't do the full diagnosis, but make sure we're hearing why they came back and they're getting a satisfactory answer to that question they came in to ask. We don't immediately say, oh, you're back now. And by the way, you missed two appointments. That wasn't good. And you're, you know, you're out of compliance. 
That will not have them come back the next time. So anyway, sorry, but go ahead. Yeah, no, you something else. No, but I, but I think that's, that keys into my other point, which is that I, uh, this period of, of sort of reassessing your priorities, a lot more people are, are going and figuring out what wasn't important that they thought was to spend right. money on. Right. They've stopped spending money on when like, I thought that was so important and that, you know, uh, I, I, I need a really expensive car. Now that you don't drive it, <laughs> you <laughs> yes. know, like, I, wasn't, I don't feel that that, that wasn't the, the joy factor of my car wasn't that high. Actually, I was caught in traffic about most of the, half the time with it. Um, but people are reassessing what's of value. And then this is another opportunity for dentistry is like I drive this home over and over again with the practices that I coach is, is dentistry is one of the best investments that people can make. And they don't get that because we don't process long term thought. We, we will. What about this week? What about today? What about next month? And now we're, we're pretty much out of gas. We can't get any further down the line than that. Um, and so we have to keep driving home the, the, the disproportionate value relative to the perceived value of dentistry. Um, but I want to, as a, as a business person, um, I want to ask you a more probing thing, which is like, what, what was your biggest mess up, your biggest failure? And, and, and then I'll ask you maybe what you, you got out of it. But where did you go? Man, I wish I hadn't done that or hadn't done that that way. Well, that's a competitive list. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, categorically, it's usually related to making very big decisions kind of all at once and then saying, I'll check back in on how this is doing, say, a year from now versus staying with it on a day-to-day -day basis and continuing to make very small adjustments through that. So I can recall, oh boy, I mean, there's so many of them, but the, you know, I can recall changing our entire sales and marketing model at one point. And watching, you know, patient flow drop off because the because things change much more slowly than I thought they would in terms of the market and how people came in. So that that was obviously a big one. Um, I would say that I've done the same thing with a number of system decisions uh, that we've made where they've been too big all at once. I've made that same had that same problem as we rolled out. And this becomes relevant for people with say several practices is changing more than one thing at a time in our organization. So everybody wants to have a call center, just like 1-800-DENTIST used to have, because that's amazing. It's fantastic. And as you know, that like that's a whole business and it's really hard, right? And then everyone wants to have, you know, centralized uh, RCM, revenue cycle management. That's a whole business and it's really hard. And then, you know, you go through your marketing model and so on. And people like, well, God, if I'm going to be a big DSO or I'm going to be a bigger business, I have to have all of these things. And so they try to make significant investments in multiple things at once. And even when we are, you know, at scale, several hundred offices trying to change more than one of those things at once brings us to our knees. And so, you know, it, it's much better. Like we rolled out RCM. It's like, wow, it looked like it was working. Let's put it in 100 offices. It's like, no, it should have went from one to two, maybe to four, <laughs> maybe to six or eight. But it doesn't just keep doubling and doubling. It's like, stop, make sure it's working, make sure you think what's supposed to happen is happening. Because these changes you make, there's this delayed impact of failure, right? When you, you think it's going okay, and then six months later, you're like, why did I think that was going okay? This is a complete disaster. And so I've blown through those things way too often and went too fast versus said, just put it in you know, a tenth of my offices. Let me take it through a whole season. And then if it's working as well as you say it is, we'll go twice as fast on the back end. Um, by the way, it's never been working as well as anyone thought it was. It's so nope. it's always this slow process. And then it probably isn't an all or nothing in your, in your business either. That You might have to have some variation. So you really have to t season these things to learn. So if you've got a business, and this has been my experience, if I have a business that's going well enough that I start thinking about these changes that'll enhance it because someone else is doing it, do it very slowly and make sure it fits your model, my model in this case, 
and that the building's wired in a way that'll connect these things. And so the other, the other probably big failure point that I continually repeat, and hopefully I'm getting better at it, is it's this wiring of the business. And there's, there's hard and soft processes in every business. There's ways you communicate. There's way data moves around. People understand how to communicate with each other. And when you make these changes, you start cutting those wires and they don't just automatically reconnect. You have to like physically reconnect them. And those things aren't abundantly obvious. They just take sometimes just a lot of discipline, but more often than not, they just take doing it, under, being eyes open to what's breaking, fixing it so that you actually have a true test case. And if again, if you have three offices, that means you're doing it in one. If you have 300, it might mean you're doing it in two or three. But it, 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 you're very careful to really pay attention to what's actually happening versus what you, people perceive to be happening. And the other thing I'd tell you is asking the person who's accountable for it how it's going is interesting, but in no way dispositive. Ask their customers how it's going over time. That's what the marketplace actually saying. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's powerful. You know, and give it yeah. a little time. Um, one thing we do, Fred, I would, I would share to people is we have a culture where it is about some layer skipping. And so if you're not comfortable with me talking to your customers, then don't work at Smile Brands. And if you're, if you're an executive and you only want to talk to the people who are in your line, you don't want to go out to skip some layers and speak to customers, it's not a good place for you because you don't add value just talking talking to the person who reports to you and then feeding back advice to them based on what they've told you. You're valuable because you're out there in the, in the marketplace. And that could be our doctors. That could be our employees. That could be our patients. Gathering that information to understand what's really happening. And then as a company saying our premium is on what's really happening and it's okay to make mistakes. Matter of fact, we love mistakes, right? But let's make sure we're serving the greater good, which is all one bottom line. It's not multiple bottom lines. Your department can't succeed while the company's failing, right? You can't, you know, have one compartment of the Titanic be successful. It doesn't work that way, right? So really having a culture where we get that right is, it's hard because you have to live, it's that say-do gap. You have to live into it. Um, and well, you think th that this, this is also important. The whole concept of accepting feedback is, is in many ways the essence of leadership is yeah. you have to be, you have to go out and get that information from the, the end of the line. As a dentist, you have to be willing to listen to your patients and your team members about stuff. And, and you can't have a, a thin skin on it. Uh, and, you know, even when I'm talking to dentists, sometimes I'll say, like, what, what are your what are your Yelp reviews and your Google reviews saying? What are people are saying? It's like, oh, I never read those. I don't I you know, it disturbs me too much. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's where all the information is so that you can fix it. You can't hide from it and tell yourself you're doing a great job as your your patient base erodes every year. Uh, there's a there's a reason for that. And they and you, we live in a world. This is, you know, part of my use of the word remarkable is we live in a world where when people remark, they do it digitally and it lives forever. Yeah. So you need to be remarkable in a positive way and learn from those negative remarks, because, you know, as you said, it, mistakes are information. Success is great, but it doesn't teach you much. Failure, mistakes. Tons of information. hundred percent. And, you know, and, and I get it. Like there's haters all the time. Right. And there's people who say, well, this is a rip off because I have to pay for it. And dentistry is supposed to be free. All right. It's not supposed to be free. Or I've had my cleanings every time. And now you're telling me I need perio and you're just trying to rip me off. I get it. Now. It's easy to be dismissive one after another of every single thing that's said. When you get to a, a, a hundred of those and you've been dismissive a hundred times, you're going like, something's going on here, right? And, and it doesn't mean that your dentistry is bad. It doesn't mean your diagnostic is bad, but it does mean something. So it, the openness to say, hey, team, this means something. What does it mean? And it might mean that in the perio case, we're just not educating patients on the fact you're getting your cleaning. By the way, you might be using a term called deep cleaning. 
dumbest term I've ever heard in my life. You should never say that ever again. You're not getting a deep cleaning. You're getting periodontal therapy, and you'll get your visible tooth surface cleaned as well as part of that. But you're getting periodontal therapy. Any more than getting a crown is not the same as a cleaning. Getting periodontal therapy is not the same as getting a prophy. So, you know, we might be doing it to ourselves. So you can say, well, all these patients just don't get it. It's like, is that right? Because yeah. who are they not getting it from, right? You're their number one dental educator. So that could be part of it. You know, so, and I, and I, if I back up a second on that, it's like your staff, your dental assistants, they know exactly what's going on. Your hygienist knows exactly what's going on. So if you're seeing this and you say, well, hold on, team, here's what's being said. I know for a fact as a dentist, my dentistry is fantastic. And that, that's probably true. But if all these Yelp reviews are saying, you're a lousy dentist, you're ripping me off, you're this and this, it's like, huh, I'm doing great dentistry. This is the perception. What do we do about this team? And if they honestly look at you and say, well, doc, like people are coming in with their crowns in their hands all the time. I don't think your dentistry is that good. You got to go like, oh, really? Okay. It's a safe place to say that. I'll take that. You know, but if that's not really what's happening and it's the way you're delivering it or the way you're explaining it or the fact that you don't ever take the mask off. Well, nowadays you're not supposed to, but back in the day, you don't ever take the mask off and look the patient in the eye and say, how are you doing today? Or you don't show the care, right? I mean, it's probably something much more like that that surrounds your dentistry, but you have to be open to everything, right? Yeah. Then your team knows and they can reconcile, well, this is being said, we can close that gap, make a plan together. But the first thing is being open to it, like saying, let's understand this together as a team. Let's get this right. Um, and it has to be a safe place for them to express whatever they're seeing. That's hard, um, but that, yeah. that's what's critical. Well, and this is this is where you function in many ways as a data aggregator for these practices, yeah. just like uh, somebody who coaches several practices is able to say, look, yeah. you, you have about a 15 percent redo from your labs. Yeah. The average is three. <laughs> That's data. So, yep. Yep. Right. You know, so let's figure out how you, you know, or your case acceptance is 22 percent. The average is 35 the average successful practice is 54, okay? Yeah. So that's what's doable if you just do it right. You are not halfway there. So you've got great dentistry and you you are missing key skills, which prevents your patients from getting the benefit of your great dentistry. Yep. So don't go, that's not me. I just want it. They should just want great dentistry for me. But as soon as you say the word should, <laughs> you're in trouble. Yes. That's they're constantly reminding me of that. It's like, when that word's in the sentence, stop, yeah. right? Because yeah. you're expecting the people people to be somebody they are not. Yeah. If it's preceded right. by you, it's the bad word. If it's preceded by I, it's okay. I should, right? I should listen, right? Yeah. That's not bad. You should. Don't yeah. tell anyone else that. You, that so, that's not good. I agree with um, you totally. Yep. How, how do you feel about dentistry as, as, as in general? Do you, do you see it? Are you bullish on us as an industry? Or have we have we had our heyday and now we're going to tough it out? I think we're going into the true golden age of dentistry. I say that with the caveat that if you're looking backwards at what you perceive to be the, the prior golden age, then you're not going to feel like this is the golden age. If you're looking forward and saying, wow, center of healthcare." Technology has enabled a general dentist to do more with that license appropriately than ever before in terms of delivering a breadth of services. Our ability to deliver the highest quality dentistry, which means in proper occlusion, it means, you know, in a very attractive format and a very reasonable price. I mean, it's amazing what's available to us now in the profession. You, know, you mentioned the redo rate. Ah, oh, your redo rate's so high. Well, that may be a perfect case for someone to get a scanner and start electronically submitting those impressions, right? That's an incredible opportunity to reduce that issue, right? Uh, and by the way, potentially save a visit and time and all kinds of things. So there's all these remarkable opportunities in dentistry, but it's moving faster than it's ever moved. I feel like, again, like in 20 years, it barely moved. I mean, it wasn't that different between 1998 and, you know, pick 20 years later, right? 08, 09, 10, 
a little further. It really didn't change that much. Um, some things you can do whatever you wanted to, and, and you, you could run your business fairly lamely, yeah. okay, and still make a, a, a good living, yeah. and still treat a lot of people. And 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 it was really hard to go out of business. And then in 2008, it was suddenly really easy to go out of business. It, yeah, um, it was real. It was it was tough then, and then you know it got it kind of went back a little bit more like it was. And now I think yeah. COVID hit, and I. I don't think it's going to go back. And I, and I think the difference is that the technological confluence and the healthcare confluence wasn't there coming off the 0809 change. Coming off the 2020 change, it's different. All these forces have been behind it, and now they're here on the other side of it. And I think you, you can't go back. You got to go forward. But with that idea of going forward, I just think. You don't go crazy. Remember my earlier point about don't change everything so dramatically. Just be changing. Just be yeah. changing. And that's what's important. Um, and so I, I think we're headed into a golden age because it, it feels like it's, it's hitting the center of healthcare. There's incredible technological advancements to make this profession more efficacious, but also create confidence in that efficacy for the consumer and the payer. Right, whether that could be through the use of the artificial intelligence opportunities, which we need to take an active lead in shaping how that's deployed in our profession to create confidence in the efficacy. So there's huge opportunity there. Now, if everyone's saying, wow, this is powerful in terms of number one, I know I need this because it's proven. And number two, I know this is actually preventative of a major healthcare issue downfield, right? If you use AI, for example, to say, that progressive bone loss is a pre precursor to heart disease. Now, all of a sudden, perio treatment isn't just so your teeth stay in your mouth, right? It's so you're alive and viable. So there's that's coming or it's here. It's right in that zone right now in between those two things. But that is the heyday for our profession because I almost never, and I met a lot, a lot, a lot of dentists and, and uh hygienists. I very rarely met a provider. The first words out of their mouth when you ask, why did you go into dentistry? Yeah, I want to help people. I want to make a difference, right? They have to pay student loans and support a family, but they want a profession that actually helps people. And dentistry has got an incredible opportunity to do that. And it's right there for us, but we have to embrace it. And that part of that embracing it is that open-minded dialogue with patients to say, this is a big deal. It's not a deep cleaning right? It's periodontal therapy, right? The, I'm, this is important to make a choice where I'm advocating for my patient to get this really attractive crown that's anterior, right? Because I'm cementing this in your mouth. Like this isn't a new pair. You used Nike earlier. It's not a new pair of Nikes that are going to wear out in, you know, eight, 10 weeks and you, or two months. And you can go buy another pair if you don't like it. This I'm actually taking cement and I'm cementing it in your mouth. So let's make the right choice and then figure out how to make it affordable, accessible, meet them on their terms. Um, same thing with all the orthodontic opportunities. There's a bunch of different ways to treat people based on their need, but that makes their life better. It makes their dentition last longer, uh, which is important. Hopefully we all live a long life and we want our own teeth in our mouth. Well, and there, I think that anti-aging is not a fad. It's not a fringe idea anymore. I think longevity is becoming more and more appealing as well as healthy longevity. It's like, I don't want to, I want to live to at least to be 150, but I want to look like this. Right. I want to move yeah. and I want to eat like I eat now. Right. Uh, right. And, and so it's that the quality of that age is going to be really important and, and should be. And I think that's a trend that I think that inaugurates the, the golden age of dentistry as much as anything, because the, the human body has a way of, of aging us and it, it does a, a good job of aging our teeth and our soft tissue. Well, it does. And I would also say that, you know, it's moving fast enough that if you're not willing to embrace it, you're going to look a, you're going to look bad, your business is going to suffer, and you're going to get sued a lot, in my opinion. So think about this. You know, a standard of care was a three-unit bridge not that long ago. 
you know, when you lost a tooth. Right. We're not very far from that looking like leeches, in my opinion. I mean, <laughs> right. think about what you're doing there. You're taking two virgin teeth down to bridge one gap. When you compare that in the light of that to a single tooth implant, I mean, it starts to sound like leeches over here. When you're going like, are you, you're really going to take two teeth down that are perfectly healthy for someone who's planning to live, you know, past a hundred, you know, how's that going to work out for that person? You're losing bone underneath that bridge anyway. How long is that going to last compared to that single tooth implant, which they can care for and maintain for their lifetime? And so you see those things moving fast, which means the dentist has to continue to expand his or her capabilities away from the three unit bridge to the single tooth implant in that example. And I think there's lots of procedures like that. Doing dentistry in traumatic occlusion, when you can offer all these different orthodontic modalities, is going to be the same thing. It's like, how would you do that, Doc? That tooth's going to fail five years or 10 years from now. You can't do that. You got to get the occlusion right first. The tools are there for you. So I think that's all changing quickly, which, again, if we embrace it, and it doesn't mean you turn your practice on a 180, but if we embrace it and move in that direction, what dentistry is capable of doing for the average person is huge, which that's to me how you get this next generation of people, which are going away from dentistry, right? 50 going to 39%. That's how you bring them back in because you're meeting the needs they have in a way they understand them. They're better for them. And by the way, when someone gets their teeth, gets an improvement in their smile, they become a patient for life. That's how you do it, right? Now they're invested and they care about it and they've seen positive feedback. And we go back to positive feedback. We don't go back to negative feedback, right? We reach out for the stove, burn our hand, don't go back. <laughs> reach out, grab a piece of candy and go, that was delicious. Unfortunately, we keep going back. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, there's, there's a, 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 an opportunity to capitalize on technology you know even something as simple as as uh bone density i think people haven't really heard it but once they hear it it's like oh that triggers an understanding because they've heard of osteoporosis yes. and stuff like that for a long time and you say guess what there's bone loss going on here whenever there's a missing tooth and and yeah. it only goes one way unless we arrest it we can turn that around but not by eliminating teeth. Um, and I think people can have these awakenings. So, you know, that's why I'm, I'm in the marketing world is I'm always, I'm looking for that message that resonates with people. And I think so much of, of what dentistry can do that people actually care about is uh, become, it can be made much more apparent by using the right words, periotherapy versus deep cleaning and, and things like that. Fred, I, it's so interesting. You mentioned the marketing world. I, one of my, one of the things I share in dentistry is like, you know, we were set back further by that Polydent commercial from years ago where that attractive looking, I think it was an older woman in the ad, but it was an attractive looking senior takes a bite of an apple. <laughs> you know, it's thank you, Polydent. And like a whole generation of people are like, well, that would be my long-term plans. I've got these teeth. They don't look great. But boy, when I get older, I'll just pull them all and I'll get those perfect looking dentures and I'll just take a bite of that apple and off I go. And it's like, then I end up in dentistry a decade later or whatever it was. I'm like, has anyone ever done a denture that can actually retain to biting into an apple? And people are just laughing. Like, of course not. You know? And so you think about it, like that's the old mentality. And then we're in the world where we have to message, no, you're losing all the bone under that denture. That person's not going to be able to wear that for the rest of their life. They're not functioning like they were in that TV commercial that whole time. We can actually create a better world, but here's what it looks like. More complex message over here than biting into the apple. But this is reality. And, you know, you plan on living a long time. You want to be over here. So let's talk about a plan for that. So I do think the messaging is incredibly important. And I think to, to, to go back to where we started, the simplicity in that messaging. Yeah. And so. But the idea of periodontal therapy, the idea of maintaining the bone structure to support your teeth for a long time, we can get to simple around that. People can understand it and then we can deliver to it. So I think there's, a, again, there's a huge opportunity. It's just not looking 
back. It has to be pivoting forward. And, and we have the technology and the skills. And I will say that you mentioned what surprised me so much about dentistry is like the skill set of the practitioners. Again, I kind of mentioned working in that small area, but that skill set and the artisanship and the heart that they put into it. I mean, the heart in the profession of dentistry in terms of how much people really care about the outcomes for their patients, it's it's beyond what I've seen anywhere else, including anywhere in healthcare. It's it's really impressive. Um, and it's what keeps me coming back excited every day is it's just like people really care about helping people in this profession. And it's it's impressive. Yeah. And the dedication that I've seen across the board in my 35 years, the dedication to CE, yeah. clinical CE, has, has, uh, it is really uh, inspiring and encouraging and uh, that makes me happy that I can help them yeah. to attract patients and, and succeed and, and communicate better with patients. So uh, as we're, I want to wrap up here soon because I appreciate your time, but I want to do a little little personal lightning round here sure. uh, and uh, ask you some, some key questions. Uh, uh, Paris, London, or Rome? Which one? I want to go to Rome only because I've been to Paris and London. Uh, they're wonderful, but Rome I would like. Uh, what's the worst meal you ever had? Oh, boy. Uh, I tried to cook my kids this chicken once that I thought would be extra moist because the way I was going to prepare it and uh, having to straight face my th my way through that uh, chew leather was um, the worst I'd ever had. <laughs> so you you made yourself <laughs> the worst. I made myself ever the worst meal ever. Um, um, what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie is The Sixth Sense, which I yeah. thought was just incredible for the way it was put together and the way just it, the way the end made you look back at the entire film totally differently. I thought it was just an incredible experience. Steve, thank you so much. I, uh, I've appreciated our long friendship, but I, I, I very much appreciate your uh, hard work in the industry uh, to make it better. Uh, and for every one of us uh, out there uh, and uh, Really appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you in the flesh one of these days out there. So. Soon it will be. Yes, soon it will be. We'll get out there. But uh, I would say the same, Fred, with regard to you. You've done some remarkable work in the space and you're always giving and uh, open to helping people move it forward. And, and that will be a, a great legacy. Uh, not that you're near done, but uh, that'll be a great no. legacy in the space to, uh, to keep, you know, be known as one of the guys. And you really are. Uh, who's always been moving it forward. So thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. So uh, to all of our listeners, I'm going to do the usual stuff at the end of a podcast and say, please subscribe to it. Uh, if you know remarkable dentists that should be interviewed on the show or you think you're remarkable enough, uh, please email me at fredjoyle at gmail.com. I am also in Southern California putting together a, a very small group of high-end practitioners um, for a mastermind. Um, and it's people have been looking for ways to work with me directly. And I've created some one-on-one -on -one coaching and also putting together this mastermind. So if that's of interest to you as well, uh, if you have always wanted a chance to tap into my brain, this podcast is going to be one way to do it, but I'm really tapping into other people's brains right now for the podcast. Uh, so Go to fredjoyle.com or, or email me directly and uh, let's talk. And, uh, I've, and otherwise, keep being remarkable. <laughs>